that Indian Act. It was done and enacted as law in 1876. This is only a legislative piece of document. It can be changed at any time. It can come out of legislation at any time if the government chooses. It is not a constitutionally protected document. When it was first enacted, they had hoped five to 10 years at most. Then, the, we won't need it anymore because the Indian problem will have been resolved. There will not be any Indians left in this country. Today, in 2013, there are two, 633 First Nation communities that are under the guise of this one act. What started out as assimilation and integration is now nothing more about control. Anything back in the day, 1800s and 1900s, anything they wanted the Aboriginal people not to do, they threw up laws. This is where they banned the potlatch, this is where they banned the, the sun dances, this is where they banned the regalia and all of the other things that came down with it. This is where they banned Aboriginal people from hiring lawyers for land claims, and that remained in the Indian Act until 1920. This is where they said, you as an Aboriginal person cannot leave the boundaries of the reserve without the permission of your local Indian agent. So if you needed to actually go hunt or trap or fish or whatever, go to town and try and find your groceries, well, you need to go to the Indian agent and say, I need to leave the village. He'll say, well, how long do you need? He'll tell him. He'd say, you have from this day to this day, give you a piece of paper or a permission pass to leave the reserve. And then he'd say, if you're not back by this day, I have every right to come and arrest you and throw you in jail. Not just any jail, it was called Indian jail. That's where they threw all the Indians that did not go by the laws of the Indian Act. One of the most crazy laws that I have seen, and there are a few crazy laws in this Indian Act, but one of them is in the prairies, they actually tried to convert the local people into farmers. And when you can't leave the boundaries of the reserve, well, you do what you can on reserve. So they got really good at farming. The local farmers outside of the reserve started complaining. They went to Canada and said they have an unfair advantage. And so what did Canada do? They enacted a law, a law that said, if you are Indian and living on reserve, you no longer have the ability to operate or possess mechanized farming tools. You can only farm through handheld tools from this day forward. Everyone else was happy, but it made life very difficult on reserve. The one question I want to leave you with with regards to this is, once you're unable to leave the boundaries of the reserve for a people that was very reliant to the land for food, hunting, trapping, fishing, medicines, berries, what do you think that has? What kind of impact does that have on your, your village, your society? Once you were self-sufficient, on the other hand, you become reliant and dependent on someone that really doesn't care whether you live or die. This was the entire philosophy of the Indian Act, to keep the Aboriginal people in a condition of tutlage. Tutlage is an old English word that means 100% control or guardianship. That we would be wards or children of the state property to the crown. That they would make every effort to aid the red man in lifting ourselves out of that condition of tutelage so that only then will we be able to assume all of the privileges and responsibilities of a higher civilization and then full citizenship. So in essence, break you down, break you down, break you down. As they're breaking you down, they're digging this hole for you throw you in that hole and say, we're not going to teach you how to live in this new life. We just don't want you to behave like you were in the past. And we're going to leave it up to you to try and find your own way out of this hole and live in the, this new world that we're creating. That's what the Indian Act is about. It was never about the benefit of the indigenous population. 
One good example of how it impacts us today, my grandmother who passed away a year ago in February, she died as an Indian on reserve without a will. Because she's property to the crown, all of her estate, all of her property doesn't come to the decision of the family and it's a year later, we still have yet to receive any word of what, how her estate is going to be resolved. Because that goes back to Ottawa and the bureaucrats in Ottawa are the ones that are going to determine who gets her land, who gets her house, who gets her property. Such as the, she didn't have many jewels, but they meant something to her, right? <laughs> but that's how it impacts us today. If I had my way, I'd say, let's get rid of this because it isn't about us. It isn't about you guys or the general Canadians in general. It's just about controlling a race of people in this very day that we talk, we talk about equality and equity and prosperity. It's like what you do with this hand, you're not doing with this hand. The aggressive assimilation policy was the first law that came into place that said, we have every right to come in and remove your children from your homes. Did not say that they had to go into school, but where else were they going to go? Of course they were going to these institutions because it was an easier way to try and change this race of people. In 1907, Canada again wanted to know, are we meeting our goals and objectives? So they hired, well actually he was already hired by the government. He, they seconded him over from a different department. He is a chief medical examiner. And in, his job was to go visit a dozen schools across this country. And as soon as he went into these schools, he quickly found out that there was inadequate food, inadequate clothing, there was inadequate heating sources for the buildings, as well as deaths, many deaths due to disease, and unexplained deaths. In 1907, this report on the end there is from a school in Alberta, and that mortality rate at that school was 50%. In BC, our mortality rate for the schools in BC were on the lower end, between 30 to 40%. By his calculations, 150,000 Aboriginal children are anticipated to have attended these schools. 55 to 80,000 Aboriginal children are estimated to may have not made it home alive from these schools. We do have a missing children's task force to try and find out where these missing or these mass graves are on the property. They have been trying for years. I've been at this for three years, so the three years I've been doing this, they've been trying to get the information from both Indian Affairs and the churches through the Freedom of Information Act. And they have been setting up these roadblocks and getting that information out. They have received now some information, and today we can con concretely say they have evidence of at least 3,000 children that did not make it home alive. That's about 3%. But they also found out that in the 30s, they stopped keeping track of the number of deaths that were taking place in these schools. So we may never know the true number of these schools, the deaths that occurred in these schools. So again, I ask a question, because I, I tend to ask too many questions in my life. Was that purposeful? Was it because these children didn't mean anything or, which is the same result, was it just because there was too many deaths that were occurring that they, sh they just stopped keeping track? Dr. Bryce also, when he handed in this report, he was discredited. He was forced into early retirement and his retirement came in 1922 and when he retired, him and John Malloy wrote this, collaborated on this book called A National Crime. And before he left, he said to Canada, now that you know what's going on in between these walls of these schools, if you do nothing about it, you are deliberately putting at risk each and every child that attends the school. Canada shelved his report and did nothing. 
the irony of it all is in 1920, they hired another doctor, maybe a different doctor that was going to give different results. His name was Dr. Corbett. And when Dr. Corbett did his study, he found the exact same results Dr. Bryce did in 1907. Dr. Corbett did a third study in 1922. Again, no change in the system at the schools. Dr. Bryce also talks about other things in the school, saying that 90 to 100 percent of all children that attended these schools suffered some form of severe physical, emotional, or sexual abuse. Even if we took away the sexual abuse and the physical abuse that took place in these schools, and you only have that one act of removing the children from their homes and placing them in these educational institutions without the permission of their family, without knowing where they're going, without knowing if they're ever going to see their families ever again, is trauma enough to impact your life on a mental level, emotionally and physically? And how is that going to impact not your life, but the children that comes after you? But we are aware of the sexual abuse that took place in these schools. In 1988 was when the first students came forward, former students of these schools came forward with allegations of abuse that took place in these schools. 28 of them are from St. George's Indian Residential School. They alleged this priest did nasty things to them. He, that one priest was convicted and charged of over 420 counts of sexual abuse against boys during his tenure at that school. That's only one priest in one school. We're not talking about the others or anything else that took place in them. Out of that 28, 22 of them committed suicide shortly after revealing their story. Because for the most part, this, that was the first time that they even acknowledged or even voiced what happened to them in these schools. I'd already talked about the missing children and the task force that's out there. And that's all I'm, the only other thing I'm going to say about that is everyone deserves to be laid to rest, to know that they are remembered. And that's all we're trying to do here for them. These schools were also breeding grounds for experiments, especially for a disease that was, was plaguing this entire country, and that was tuberculosis. So in the schools, what they would do is say, healthy child, play with sick child. And then they would sit back and say, how long did it take for that healthy child to show the symptoms? What were the exact symptoms if they were given medicine? Did that medicine assist, get them better or not? If it didn't get them better, how long did it time from the time of contact to the time of their ultimate death? The only a problem with once the kids contracted tuberculosis, they were sent away to Indian hospitals because the facilities at the schools didn't have enough of the medicines to take care of them. The only thing with Indian hospitals is that's where more horror stories began and more experiments began. And that's a totally different story than what I'm telling you here today. Just, but just know there's other stories that are going to be coming forward later on about all of the other atrocities that took place. This is Duncan Campbell Scott. He is our Minister of Aboriginal Affairs between 1913 to 1932. This is Canada's assimilation policy. Very simple. He wants to get rid of that Indian problem. And he will do whatever it takes to ensure that, that there is not a single Indian in this country that has not been absorbed by the political body. And we no longer have an Indian question. And they were doing anything and everything they could to get rid of that problem. They didn't care if you were still what they call red skin. <laughs> they just wanted you to be a part of civilization. He was famed for one other thing in his tenure. 
and that was the mandatory attendance for all Aboriginal children to attend these Indian residential schools. If you were Aboriginal between the ages of 7 and 15, you were mandated to attend these schools. However, once they got the kids into the schools by age 7 and up, they quickly realized these children were harder to break. They already knew their language, they already knew their culture, they already knew some of their traditions. So it made their life a little bit more difficult. So instead of changing the law, what they ended up doing is just taking them at a younger age. Two, three, four, five-year-olds being taken away from their families and sent to these schools. Once it was in law, these are some of the modes of transportation that they were transported in. They would fill these cattle trucks to the brim where you'd be shoulder to shoulder, no sitting room, and just driving maybe a few kilometers away, sometimes hundreds of kilometers away. And if you were further away, like some of my colleagues at, that I work with from Haida Gwaii and Niska, if you were from Niska, you got put into the hulls of steamboats and did not see the light of day until you got to your destination. If you were from Haida Gwaii, they were put into cattle or cargo planes and then put into cattle trains. My one colleague that was from Haida Gwaii did that exact trip, except her final destination was Edmonton. And she, the only thing that she says is, for me, that transition was really difficult, because when you're living by the water, you're living by the mountains, and all of a sudden you're in the prairies, and there's no ocean, and there's no mountains, and it's all flat land. Her transition was really difficult, especially the winter, she said. <laughs> this mandatory attendance ended in 1948. And I'd like you to keep track of that date, because in a few slides we're going to talk about 1948 a little bit more. So just imagine, whether it's you or if you have children or grandchildren, imagine you are five years old. Imagine you have somebody coming to your door and saying you have to give up your children to go to these places. Imagine that once you actually got to these places, your identity was stripped away from you and you were given a number instead of your name. And that's who you were known as from the time that you entered that school to the time that you leave. There was never any transition that was saying, you must only speak English or French from this day forward. It was, you will speak English. And if you were caught speaking your, your mother tongue, you were beaten senseless. In some cases, if you didn't get it, they would put needles in your tongues so that you would actually understand. English is the way you need to go. It is God's language, and you will speak God's language. Now imagine you're that parent, watching your children go away, not knowing if you'll ever see them again. That if you didn't send your kids, that you were threatened with jail. If you went to jail for refusing your kids to go, you were fined $100 to $150. Back in the day, $100 to $150 is a lot of money. So of course they're not going to be able to pay that fine. And six months was added on to their sentence. They would spend a year in jail and the kids would still be taken away to school. And imagine being cut off from them for months and months at a time not knowing if you're ever going to see them again. And in many cases, they never did see their children ever again. If you did survive residential school, well, a lot of the kids did not go back home to their communities. They were isolated, so you never did get to see your families once again. So imagine what that does to your family structure, your relationships with your children, your relationships with your siblings. How does that impact your family? And how will that let you survive into this society? You heard me earlier saying we were never a part of this country. We were not legally a part of this country until 1960 <coughs> because we were just that problem, that problem that needed to be fixed. John Diefenbaker here was the first prime minister to say you as an Aboriginal person of this country, I am going to give you this one basic right, this basic right to vote in federal elections. Right beside him 
is Chief Joe Mathias of the Squamish Nation. And that's him and his family exercising his first to right to vote in a federal by-election in 1962 in North Vancouver. Again, we weren't asked if we wanted to be a part of it. It was just given. It was something that we just anticipated. Oh, you want to be a part of this country? Let's just give it to you and we'll be a part of it. See, the thing is with Canada is whenever they deemed normally, whenever they deemed that they were giving you something, they expected something in return. That payment in return was your complete identity of being Aboriginal. And then we call it even. Nineteen forty eight. What happened in the world that we actually had to go and define the word genocide? Many of us have lived it. My grandfather went to go fight in World War II for a country that did not want him. For him to go fight in that country, he had to enfranchise himself and his family to go do so. The only difference is, is when he came back, what other soldiers got and received for honor of their service that they attended there, he received nothing. Even though he was enfranchised, they said, you're Indian, go back to your reserve and find your own house and your own way. What many people don't understand is, or even know, some of our most highly decorated soldiers in this country are Aboriginal. Tommy Prince is the most highly decorated soldier this country has ever seen. The only difference is, Many other Aboriginal soldiers did not get the same treatment that he may have got. You see, he got acknowledged. His name got acknowledged, and we know his name to this day. If you go to the War Veterans Museum, they'll have pictures of soldiers on the wall, and it will say, unidentified Indian soldier. Another definition that tried to get passed by the United Nations is cultural genocide. It was ultimately rejected, but once you read the definition, you can understand why it was rejected because it's what makes the systematic destruction of traditions, values, and languages that make us different and unique from one another. Probably most countries would be convicted if this definition of genocide was passed by the United Nations. Take a look at this picture. This is in 1874, and his name is Thomas More. This is what Canada's message was. This is what they had hoped to give out to the general population. When you look at Thomas More here, you see his face slightly, a little bit darker, a little bit dirtier. His hands on his braid, which comes down to about here. He has a gun in his hand, in his regalia, or his natural set of clothes, and it's Quite clearly, they're trying to make him look savage, brutal, hostile. You know, that whole definition that we were brought up to believe. And then you go to the other side, and that's Thomas More after residential school. His, his face is a few shades lighter in some really nice, give, you know, nice clothes, nice haircut, looking really civilized and a part of society. This is the definition of cultural genocide. At my office, we have a lot of other things that we deal with. And our, we have resolution health support workers, and their job is to actually sit with the survivors that go to these adjudication hearings where they're telling their story, in most cases, again, for the very first time. And we get a lot of stories from them. And one story that I will share with you, and it's not my own, is if you're seven years old, you're in this school, you're told you're dirty, that you're told you're not going to achieve anything, you're told you're just a dumb Indian, that your skin needs to be dark, lighter because that's a part of who we are in this society. This one child started believing this because right from the time that they're in these schools, they're told, if you don't abide by 
our moral code, you will burn in hell forever. In fact, you're five years old, you're gonna believe what these adults are telling you. Because I have one survivor that also says, I didn't want to burn in hell forever, so I didn't want to kill myself because his main thought was to try and kill himself. And he said, I wanted to live here on this earth because what if I go, what if I do die and then I burn in hell forever? He was 55 at the time and he still believed it. This other elder would say, I am dirty, aren't I? Look at my skin, I'm really dark, I'm dirty, soap is not working. So what did she do to try and resolve and fix that problem? She started bathing herself in bleach every day to try and make her skin a few shades lighter so that she would maybe, hopefully, start getting better treatment in the schools than what she was getting previous to that. 